Hello, my name is Christian Martius, and this is Mercifully Short Stories, a podcast telling tales for the distracted, hyperactive, and noticeably absent. Episode one of Mercifully Short Stories contains a piece called Press Play, which is written and read by me. Press play. Next to his bed, on a rickety side table meant for a plant pot, is a tape recorder. Inside the machine, underneath a smudged plastic window, there is a tape labelled sleep. Out in the hallway, a number of thin cassette shelves, no more than six inches in diameter, point towards the kitchen. On a shelf in the kitchen, where a radio should be, is another tape playing machine. In the living room, there are similar devices. Even the bathroom has something which can play recordings, but it runs on batteries and is not plugged into the wall. He remembered how odd it was when she told him she couldn't write without background noise. When they first met, she said she often put the TV on when she had a paper due for class the next day. In his car, before they kissed, she would reach over to turn the volume up on the radio. The first time she touched the dial, he wondered what she needed to drown out. Their apartment together rumbled with passing night trains, which sometimes knocked stray ornaments off unsteady surfaces. In those moments, as objects rained down around her, trying their hardest to disturb, he suspected she chose that home because of the nearby sound of the rolling carriages. Their life together was one of commotion, and not just because of her nature but he didn't see the clamour she brought into his life as noise. It was the sound of being alive. And when she left, she took that sound with her. The silence was deaf, or dead airspace, as it is sometimes called. Nothing accentuates nothingness more than the sound of nothing. She wasn't coming back, so the only thing he could do was bring some sound back into his life. The first recording was of the traffic outside his window. In every moving car is a living person, after all. He taped the birds chattering to each other and his neighbour's dog barking at the sidewalk. He began by moving the immediate world outside into his apartment. These experiments were crude, but they worked. In his first mornings with cars and birds and dogs, he began to feel less alone. Soon he bought a portable tape recorder, an object he could carry inconspicuously. He would take it with him to the local diner and record the indignant sound of an espresso machine angrily preparing a customer's order, or, if lucky, the conversations of people within range of the microphone. On the street, he could capture a cell phone talk meant for two, but eventually given to three. If people walked and talked in front of him, he would follow and press a red button inside his jacket pocket. Such actions made him feel like one of those street photographers who worked in a time when it was acceptable to take photographs of strangers on the street. Not that he ever revealed to the people he recorded that the words they were saying were documented. In time, the nature of the audio logs became more sophisticated, less random and more meaningful to him. There was a library of sounds he could draw from and soon he learned how to cut them up and rearrange them into new creations. Now there were sounds that probably wouldn't exist if he hadn't manipulated them into existence. Two people who had never met could have a dialogue. Someone could confide in him that their innermost secrets they never knew they had or had even uttered to anyone. Sound had come back into his life, but this time by his own measure and his own terms. Time would do what it always does, and he lived with all the sounds he collected, alone. 
From wherever he stood in his home, he could reach out and press play. This was a form of happiness. But perspectives change, and if you are smart enough, that change is constant. The sounds he created stopped being alive. He realised that they never were alive. They were just primitive facsimiles of existence. And the very act of recording was like putting sound into a coffin. He stopped recording and he stopped listening. And in the new silence, he remembered what it was that he missed about her so much. It was the surprise of the randomness of her actions. For when she reached for the comfort of noise, it wasn't sound itself that suggested life, but the contingency of her capricious character. He was concentrating on the end rather than the means. Soon he would live in silence again with the possibility of sound all around. I hope you enjoyed this brief little story and it hasn't taken up too much of your time. More fleeting episodes of Mercifully Short Stories will be available for your instant pleasure soon.